I've been asked to explain how we are fortunate enough to have a world famous author of multiple best selling novels come to Eugene, which is not exactly a hot spot on the map. <laughs> Dr. Kessler is here tonight because he graciously agreed to come after I wrote him a letter via his publisher and asked if he would consider speaking to my fall term honors college class on adventure fiction. Since he is the foremost modern adventure novelist in my mind, my favorite book among his many treasure is obviously on my class reading list. The full course title of my class is, in fact, Colloquium on Adventure Fiction, Homer to Clive Cussler. <laughs> The Honors College originally intended him to speak only in my small classroom, but so many others were interested in hearing and seeing him that we changed the venue to allow for more than in my class as well. When I discovered just how fascinating his own life is, tracking down historical wrecks, founding NUMA, the National Underwater and Marine Agency, relaxing in the New York Explorers Club, of which he's a member, exploring ruins, collecting antique cars, diving archaeological sites, I decided he should also add to his talk comments about living the adventurous life. I also found that in the New York Explorers Club they had honored him with their own coveted Lowell Thomas Award for Outstanding Underwater Exploration. The State University of New York went even further and awarded him a Doctor of Letters, a true degree, not an honorary one, for his work. They accepted in place of a thesis his book, The Sea Hunters, a nonfiction book, describing how he found the Confederate submarine, the Hunley, the Leopoldville, which is World War II troop transport, as well as a famous German submarine, the U-21, and scores of other historically significant sunken wrecks. So, let me introduce then the world-famous author of Sahara, Inca Gold, Iceberg, The Sea Hunters, Dragon, and now his best-selling new novel, Polar Shift. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Clive Kustel. stories, but there is one that's kind of fascinating. Um, there was this Hollywood producer who collected books, and like most collectors, any time he was with other people, soon the conversation turned to his collecting books. And so one day a director and a actor who was working on his current movie decided to fix him. And they brought in an actor from the New York stage whom the producer did not know. So they went out to lunch at the commissary, and this fellow they brought in from New York was introduced as the director's cousin from Kansas. So they're sitting there, and they're talking, and they, they introduce him, and, and they're having lunch. And, and within minutes, the producer, of course, true to form, turned the conversation to books and his collection and started out with, oh, I just bought a new Charles Dickens, you know, first edition of, you know, Great Expectations and so on, and he's babbling away. And pretty soon this, this actor says, you know, we used to have an old book on the farm. And the producer, just to be courteous, says, well, tell me about it. And he said, oh, he said it was an old Bible. And, um, <laughs> and so he said, well, do you remember anything about it? And he says, only that it was printed in German. <laughs> and the producer says, oh, well, he says, remember anything else? He said, oh, it had all these pretty pictures, and, and, and uh, it could go on. Oh, yeah, and it was, you know, it was just it was this big, thick thing, leather bound, had all these funny, pretty pictures, you know. And he said, do you remember who printed it? And he said, oh, gosh, begin with a G. <laughs> Guten something, and the producer, my God, he says, a Gutenberg Bible? And I said, yeah, that was it. And the producer, oh my God, you've got a Gutenberg Bible? And the guy says, well, I used to. And he says, well, I'll, where, where is it? He says, I'll buy it. I'll give you $20 million for it. And the, the fellow just acted nonchalant. And he says, oh, no, no. He says, I threw it away. <laughs> and the producer was horrified. And he said, my God. He says, you don't understand. You threw away a Gutenberg Bible? 
He said, I'd have paid you $20 million for it. And I thought, oh, you wouldn't have wanted it. He said, what do you mean I wouldn't have wanted it? And he said, it was no good. He said, what do you mean it was no good? And the guy said, oh, some guy by the name of Martin Luther scribbled all over it. <laughs> Author is no big deal, believe me. I, I remember my fantasy when I was writing was I never dreamed, you know, well, you always hope that you're going to get published, of course, but I, I never dreamed that it would be a big deal. I, I just, but my fantasy was that someday I would walk down the street and I would see somebody like sitting on a bus bench reading one of my books. That was my big fantasy. And I was working at the time in advertising in Denver. And uh, I published a, a little hardcover. They printed 5,000 and sold 3,200 of them. <laughs> that was a collector's item. And so the art director and I were going out to lunch one day, and he said, I have to stop by my attorneys and sign some papers. I thought, okay. So while he was in there, I was walking up and down the hallway just to wait for him and kill some time. And I walked by this office and looked in, and here was this still seer in my mind, this gorgeous little brunette, secretary, I guess, uh, sitting there at a desk, eating her sandwich and an apple, you know, with her, with her brown bag, and she was reading a copy of my book called Iceberg. Well, the sun burst through the clouds. <laughs> there was harp music, <laughs> trumpets, and a drum roll. <laughs> and so I, I was just staggered and I walked in and I said hello and she said hi there and I said how do you like the book and she said oh it's pretty good uh -huh. like a total jerk I said would you like me to sign it for you <laughs> and she said sign it and I said yeah my name is Kessler I wrote it <laughs> and she didn't look on the back cover she just looked up at me and she said you wrote this now think of the odds you're sitting in an office and <laughs> reading a book and some guy walks in, yeah, I wrote that. And she looked up at me and she said, you wrote this? I said, yeah. And she got up from behind the desk, she edged around me like I had the plague, <laughs> walked out the door, and just before she disappeared out the door, she turned around and she said, what are you, some kind of asshole? <laughs> Shattered. <laughs> and then I was on an airplane and a fellow across the aisle was reading Raise the Titanic and I said, I hope you like it. I wrote it. And he looked at me and he said, Bullshit, show me your driver's license. <laughs> and I was on the subway with my accountant in New York and he said, Oh, look, look, there's somebody reading one of your books. You know, go over and say something. And I said, No, you don't know how much. <laughs> One story that everybody always wants me to tell, I've told it, I guess, more times than Judy Garland sang Over the Rainbow, but um, I had written two manuscripts, and uh, I thought, I need an agent. Well, I was, that time I was uh, working out in L.A., and I was writing and producing radio and TV commercials, and I knew uh, casting, uh, you know, directors and, and casting uh, agencies, but I didn't know any literary agents. So I contacted everybody I knew, William Morris and what have you, and got names of literary agents, about, I guess, 15 or 20 of them in New York. And so instead of using the usual route with a letter of introduction and so forth, I, I got sneaky. So I got the art director of the agency, and I had him make up this stationery. And he really did a nice job on a big key and uh, for a design. And then it, I had it say, Charles Winthrop Agency. Uh, I thought Winthrop was a classy name, and I lived on Winthrop Drive when I was a kid. And so I didn't put a phone number. I just I used my dad's address, which was a little jazzier than mine. So I took the first name on this list, and his name was Peter Lampack, who was a literary agent with the William Morris Agency in New York. And I wrote on the letter, I said, Dear Peter, as you know, I primarily handle motion picture and television screenplays. <laughs> However, I've run across a couple of book-linked manuscripts, which I think have a great deal of potential. <laughs> I would like to pursue them, but as we discussed, I'm retiring. Would you like to take a look at them? 
So Dad called about it, ten days. He says, "I got a letter here for you." So I opened it up, and it's from Peter Lampack. Says, "Dear Charlie, yeah, if you say so, I'll take a look at the manuscript." <laughs> <laughs> so I mailed him off. And about a month later, Dad says, "You got another letter from New York." So I go open it, and it says, "Dear Charlie, the first manuscript's okay, and the second one's really good. Where can I sign Clive Cussler?" And I thought, geez, it's got to be he's harder than this. You know. <laughs> so then I wrote a letter back to, you know, to, to Peter telling him where he could find Clive Custer's signed Charlie Winthrop. <laughs> and Peter sent me the contracts. I signed them. And uh, Peter, bless his heart, uh, really worked to get me published. And after three years, he still couldn't do it. And his bosses at William Morris said, don't Custler, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> and Peter wouldn't give up. And finally, we got a little paperback sold, and then, then a little hardcover. And then we had the breakthrough book, which was called Raise the Titanic. And uh, so I was in New York with my wife when we made the movie deal. And uh, this was six years later. So we went out to his wife and mine, we went out to celebrate. And we were having dinner, and I'm sitting there, and I turned to my wife, and I said, I think the time has come. <laughs> I never told him, and, and because I thought he'd throw me out. And, and, uh, but now I was his biggest client. So uh, with great trepidation, I told Peter the story of Charlie Winthrop. <laughs> and when I finished, he sat there blank, and then he laughed himself under the table. <laughs> And when he recovered, he said, oh my God, I always thought Charlie Winthrop was some guy I met when I was drunk at a cocktail party. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's been kind of a, a, you know, a wild ride. Um, and it goes back to my parents a great deal because they, my mother was, they, they were just, I was an only child, but you know, we didn't, I didn't get a lot of toys, everybody thinks an only child has it made, not in my case. But uh, they were loving parents and we had so much fun together. And my dad, uh, the stories on him were just fabulous. He, uh, he came from Germany and he was wounded in World War I. Oh, that was a cute story. My mother, um, when she was a young girl, uh, this was I think in 1917, living in Iowa, and she and her little friends went out to the carnival when it came to town. And the big deal with young girls then was to go to the gypsy fortune teller and said, can you see the man I'm going to marry? And the gypsy fortune teller said, you're going to have a famous daughter. You know, she <laughs> they came close. <laughs> and then my mom said, do you see my future husband? She says, oh yes, yes, he's tall and he's dark and he's in the army and he's wearing a gray uniform. And my mom came out of it to her friends and was laughing. She said, oh, that was ridiculous. You know, everybody knows that the Doughboys boys wear khaki. <laughs> well, of course, Dad was in the German army. He <laughs> I even had an uncle who shot down 14 Allied planes. <laughs> so Dad came to this country, and he was saying that um, you always see the pictures, you know, of the peasants getting off at Ellis Island carrying, you know, what they have in, in bundles. But he said, but it doesn't show, it doesn't tell. He said, a lot of us saved up for two, three years so we could come in first class because we wanted to come into America, you know, you know, upstanding. And so he saved up and he came over on this ship first class and he got friendly with his fellow. And Dad couldn't speak English but he could speak French, and this other fellow could speak French, so they would sit together and have dinner and converse and what have you. And Dad said, you know, there's this pretty little British girl I like to cozy up to, could you teach me some English phrases to, you know, really, you know, get next to her? So the fellow wrote out these phrases, and Dad gets a little girl, British girl, out on the deck under the moonlight after, after dinner, and lays loose. And of course, she about slapped him in the face because his fellow wrote down all these nasty sentences. <laughs> and I always laugh because Dad used to say, and this was way back when, 40s, 50s, he says, that SOB, I never forgot him, that rotten, and he'd go on and on. He said he had this stupid name, he called himself Black Jack Bouvier. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Jackie's father. So Dad gets to New York, and uh, the immigration official on the boat uh, is interviewing him, and he even had a $500 bond from his uh, brother-in-law. His sister had come over earlier and married a fellow who had a farm in, in uh, Illinois. And the fellow said, okay, and Dad was just going to go right straight from the boat, of course, into town, because first-class passengers did, plus he had the bond. As he walked away, the immigration official said, just a minute, he said, uh, you're a cripple. And Dad says, well, I have a stiff leg, I was shot in the war. And the fellow said, uh, Ellis Island. Dad says, but I, I came in first class, I've got a bond. He says, Ellis Island. And Dad used to tell great stories about Ellis Island. I always remember one about it was not a fun place to be. And he always talked about how all the men gave the mothers their handkerchiefs as diapers because they wouldn't give them diapers, you know, at Ellis Island. And so his big interview came up. And uh, the fellow told him, he said, look, speaking German, he said, uh, you sure you have an account a degree in accountancy? He says, but you can't speak English, so you can't even practice as a bookkeeper. And he said, with your stiff leg, he said, you can't dig ditches. He said, you'd just be a drain on our economy. You've got to go back to Germany. And that, of course, was shattered. So as he's walking out, he stopped and he came back and he said, I can play the piano. And the fellow says, great, we can always use musicians. So he said, I want to hear you play. So he took Dad to the big dining hall at Ellis Island. There was an old upright piano. And Dad sat down. His sister had taught him one old German marching tune. <laughs> and he said, I played it fast, I played it slow, the sweat was dripping on the keys, I kept my foot on the acoustic pedal so it reverberated all around the dining hall. He said, I wound it up with a big crescendo. And the fellow said, okay, he took him back into the office and then <laughs> came as a piano player. And, uh, <laughs> He, uh, he worked on the farm to learn English, and he said most of his English came out of the comic strips and silent movies. And then he went to Chicago, <laughs> and he was there all through the 20s, and, and uh, you know, made gin in the bathtub. He bought an old used Stutz Bearcat. He really lived it up. And uh, the great story he told about Al Capone, he said, Capone, you know, if you want to see how he ran Chicago, he said, I used to go over to the courthouse my lunch hour, and just sit there and, and pick up a few words of English. And he was coming out one day, and he, these three big limousines pulled up. And the fellows got out of the first and the third and walked around with their hands in their pockets. And then the second one, the door opened, and Al Capone got out. And apparently some zealous cop had closed the speakeasy or caught him on a traffic ticket or something. And he said, we followed him up the courthouse steps into the main lobby. And there was a court in session, and Capone walked through the door, down the aisle, pushed open the little gate, walked up to the judge, and said, not guilty. <laughs> and the judge said, case dismissed. <laughs> he walked back out, and the trial went on. <laughs> so uh, it was interesting, too, because uh, in those days, you know, uh, you didn't just meet, you know. We were always, my folks always said, we were introduced. They were in their 70s before I finally got it out of them. The dad picked mom up at the tree and on ballroom in Chicago. <laughs> so, um, when Iacocca was restoring Ellis Island, um, I, later I, I went and visited and I was I walked out to where they had this big long aluminum you know plaque and with all the names and I found his name on it because I sent him a donation and I was standing there and a the park service official came up and he said oh you're looking up an ancestor and I said yeah my father and uh, we talked and I told him the story and he said oh you've got to talk to our curator he collects those kind of stories and i said okay so he took me into the office introduced me and i so i told the fellow the story about the piano and then i said I've, I've got to catch the ferry back to new york he said before you go he said go up on the third floor in the corner so i walked up there and they have these big glass cases, and they've got like a desk and clocks and junk like that, and it's still covered with plaster and dust. 
that they saved when they were restoring Ellis Island. And I walked around this one case, and, and there was the piano. <laughs> I, I still cry. I cried like a baby. And if it wasn't for that piano, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. <laughs> so anyway, um, it was kind of a fun time uh, uh, all through that, and I had a very good childhood. And um, I was in advertising, and uh, uh, my wife took a job. She, she'd stay home when the kids were young, and then she'd you know, go back to work. And she found an interesting job working for the local police department nights. And um, it's kind of a, a clerk, dispatcher, that sort of thing. And uh, so I'd come home and I'd feed the kids, put them to bed, and I had nobody to talk to. There's nothing to do. And so I thought, I think I'll write a book. <laughs> well, I didn't have the great American novel burning inside me. I knew I couldn't write a literary book after years and years of writing short, snappy ad copy. So I thought, I know, I'll, I'll write a little paperback series. So I studied all the series heroes, beginning with Inspector DuPont. Edgar Allan Poe was the first. And then Sherlock Holmes and Matt Helm and Travis McGee and James Bond, of course. And then I thought, what can I do that's different? So I took my hero and I put him in and around water. And that's, that's how I started to write. I remember I was working on the book and my wife, you know, looked at it and she said, which I never let her forget, she said, don't get your hopes up, nothing will ever come of it. <laughs> and so uh, we struggled for a long time and then finally, as I say, the breakthrough book. And um, uh, I was paid 75, well, the publisher on Titanic uh, that had published Iceberg turned it down. They rejected it and went to Putnam and they wanted a massive rewrite and I wouldn't do it. And so then I went to Viking and they bought it as is, paid me $7,500. And so then they, England came through and paid uh, three times that, which was a nice piece of change for, for England in those days. And then it went into the paperback auction. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And so my wife was working as a secretary at Memorex in those days. And as she walked out the, the door that morning, and I said, oh, I said, you know, Peter's going to call me how the auction's going. I said, when it gets up to $250,000, I'll call you and you can quit. <laughs> well, we had a big laugh over that. <laughs> At 10 o'clock, I called her and said, you can quit. <laughs> she walked right in and gave her two weeks' notice. <laughs> so from that point, we, we never looked back. And, um, but I, uh, I've asked to talk about adventure. As far as the adventure novel, um, I just like that type of uh, book. Every, every, I always tell uh, neophyte authors, you know, how, how do I write a book? Well, you copy somebody who's successful in your genre. It's that simple. <laughs> you don't plagiarize their story, but you copy their structure, their style, their characterization, their plotting. Hemingway said that he used Dostoevsky as a guide when he started writing. Thomas Wolfe tells a great story uh, that when he was in the Merchant Marine. He was in port one day and he bought this uh, used bookstore about this book it was James Joyce's Ulysses, which was, of course, about the size of a telephone book. And he sat there while they were at sea, and he copied that book word for word, page for page, with a pencil and just scrap paper. And when he finally finished, months later, he had this huge pile of paper, and he took it back and he threw it off the stern of the ship. And his shipmate said, my God, after you wrote, you know, copied that book for months, why did you throw it away? And Thomas Wolfe said, because now I know how to write a book. <laughs> um, I used Alistair MacLean as a guide when I started writing. And then the early, let's say his books, and, and like Ian Fleming's James Bond, is what I call Formula A. You start the book, chapter one, with the protagonist and you walk straight through to the end with it. And I did that the first two, which were what I call pot boys. And then finally the third book, I started to slowly break into my own style. 
because it started out in Iceland and it's ended at the Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. <laughs> and then the next book, Titanic, was more convoluted and convoluted and convoluted. And now uh, people are telling me they're copying my style. So it's kind of fun. But uh, uh, cute story on, on Race the Titanic. I was on a book tour. And uh, I was being interviewed by this, this uh, radio uh, host. And he said, you know, I always thought that um, Sally Seagram, or whatever her name was, was going to make it with the president, because I alluded to that. And I said, she did. And he said, I don't remember it. And I said, oh yeah, the president wakes up, he had this yacht. And he couldn't wait to get out of the White House. He was a bachelor. He couldn't wait till you know, his term was up so he could get on his yacht and sail off to the South Seas. And he said he woke up and, and Sally was laying next to him in the bunk there in, in the yacht. He says, I read it and I don't remember that. And I said, oh, sure it is. And I turned the pages and it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so I called the editor at Viking and just raised hell. You don't do that to an author, you know. And uh, oh, they were all embarrassed. And he put me through to Tom Ginsburg, who was the president and, you know, the, the Viking. And I said, what the hell is going on here? And he was all embarrassed. And he said, well, he said, uh, we were kind of afraid that maybe an editor here might be embarrassed and not like it. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Well, Jackie Kennedy was an editor at Vice. <laughs> I said, my president was a bachelor. <laughs> so a lot of funny things happened. Um, I, um, and book tour, I remember it with Titanic at the time, and I was second. Leon Years was first with Trinity, and I could never knock him off. <laughs> and so I, uh, on tour, I went to this uh, little television station in Virginia. And it was just kind of stock where the editors or the, the PR people always sent you because this fellow on the TV station, and it really it pushed the books like crazy all, all over the state. So, um, I went in and you had to, during the commercial, it was a small station, you had to crawl into the camera and up on the stage and sit in the chair and the interviewer. And so after the interview, uh, I, the fellow that owned the station brought me into the office and here was just bookshelves lined with books. He collected autographed books that all the authors he had came there. And he showed me Trinity. He said, you know, Leon Years was here yesterday and he says, I don't know what I did to antagonize the man. And I said, uh, what? And he said, look. And he opened up Trinity. And years had written, he said, to Al, S Al Silverstein, who is a real shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I, I don't know what I did. So I said, well, here. I took Raise the Titanic, and I wrote to Al Silverstein, who is not a shit. <laughs> has those two books in a glass case. And he said, He's been offered $10,000 for them. Really so years later in, in the Aspen, I ran into Leon Years. And I said, I don't know if you remember or not, but years ago, were you at this little station in Virginia? And he says, I remember. He said, what happened? He said, like you, you know, commercial. Before I got, you know, just as I got there, they had a dog act. And he said, one of the dogs piddled on the stage, which was no big deal, really. And he said, and then commercial, went into the camera, got up, got on the chair of the interviewer. And when they came back, you know, the interviewer says, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're very honored today to have a great American author with us. And he turned to him and he said, now, tell us all about your new book, Mr. Urine. <laughs> Years said it made me so damn mad. <laughs> so it's it's uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I know I, I never knew that I'd, I'd be in a position like this because when I started out, I had no idea I would touch so many people. I, I just it never occurred to me. And my favorite story is uh, I've had so many letters uh, from. Uh, ex-prisoners who, who said that, you know, uh, they read my books and they wanted to be like Dirk Pitt and now they're, you know, working as a technician and they're married with two kids and, and kids who are on drugs said, you know, I wanted to be like Dirk Pitt and I, now I'm going to college and all this. Just amazing. And, uh, but one fellow wrote as a doctor from New York and he uh, 
said that he and his father were out swimming off Long Island. And he said, we got caught in a riptide and we were being swept out to sea and we were struggling and we weren't getting anywhere. And finally we were exhausted. My father said to me, he said, go on without me. He said, I can't make it. And he said, at that moment, that moment, he said, I remember reading in one of your books that Dirt Pit was caught in a riptide <laughs> and got out of it by swimming parallel to the beach. Well, I was an old California body surfer, so. And so he told his dad, he said, swim sideways, you know, along the beach. And he said, 30 feet, and we were out of it. And then the waves and current carried us back to shore. And uh, I was in New York uh, at a bookstore. And uh, the signing books, and this, uh, I told the story when I spoke. You know, I mentioned because I was in New York, I mentioned the doctor and told the story. And as I was signing books, this fellow handed me a book and he said, uh, I'm the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's amazing. You just don't realize, you know, how you reach out and, and affect people. I, I certainly, I, I stand in front of the mirror, you know, and I look, you? Because <laughs> my wife was never impressed with me. <laughs> the kids think I'm funny. <laughs> So it's um, but writing adventure. Uh, I, I I was always hooked. I, I always said if it's lost, I'll look for it. I used to tramp the deserts of, of Arizona and California looking for old lost mines and ghost towns and that sort of thing. And then I just kind of fell over into shipwrecks because they're one of the great mysteries of the sea. And uh, people always say, do you use all the shipwrecks you find everything in your books? I don't. Uh, you, you've never really seen. I mean, I've written two nonfiction books on shipwrecks but I've never really used it in the fiction books. And, uh, but there's so many marvelous stories. I, I've looked for historic wrecks, and uh, we found quite a few. I fail more often than not. And because there's always an interesting story, uh, just like one called the Lexington. It was, owned, uh, it was a fast steamer, passenger steamer, owned by Commodore Vanderbilt. He used to run from New York up to Stonington, Connecticut. And in January, it left the pier in the dead of winter. And as it was steaming just off the pier, this fellow came running down the dock with his suitcase. And just as he got to the, the, the pier, the ship, he looked and it, there was ice in the water. And he thought, no, I'm not going to jump. So he stood back and the ship sailed off without him. A few hours later, the ship caught fire. It burned and sank, killed 155 people. And the next morning, this fellow that missed the boat was sitting at breakfast, and he asked the waiter for pencil and paper. And he wrote this letter to his father. He said, Dear Father, please tell Mildred or his wife and the children that I'm all right and that I'll be home on the next steamship. Signed, Your Loving Son, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. <laughs> So it's it's uh, I know when we uh, we found the, the Lexington not the Lexington the Leopoldville and this is a, an incredible story about this American troop ship that um, was carrying this division over uh, to reinforce the troops for the Battle of the Bulge on Christmas Eve just outside of Cherbourg it was torpedoed by a German U-boat and it sank. And over 800 American GIs drowned, and it was swept under the carpet. You never heard about it. It just was not news. It was you couldn't find it in the history books. And so we found the wreck, and I, I did a news conference because at that time we also found the U-20 that sank the Lusitania. And uh, at the press conference, these four fellows showed up. They were survivors off the Leopoldville. And they sat there and they just cried because they said, thanks to you, it's known now. It, it, you know, everybody had just never, never heard of it. And so since then, uh, they've always had, you know, reunions and all sorts of things on it. So that's, things can happen like that. It was like, um, I looked 15 years for the Confederate submarine, the Hunley. And the great story about the Hunley was, um, it was a Confederate submarine and it was built in Mobile, Alabama by a fellow by the name of Hunley who funded it and also was one of the engineers. 
And General Beauregard said, can you ship it up to Charleston and see if we can't break the Union blockade? So they did. And it got up there, and this Navy crew, Confederate Naval crew, started practicing with it. And they left the hatch open as a steamship came by. It was swamped, it sank, and killed five sailors. So they raised it. And by this time, the bodies had bloated, and they had to cut them up to get them through this little hatch. And they buried these five guys out of this Confederate Naval Cemetery. So then Hunley came up from Mobile with his crew, and they worked on it and perfected it, and then he goofed one day, and he ran it on an angle into the bottom, stuck, and they couldn't get out, and he and his crew of seven men died. They raised it again. And then this lieutenant by the name of Dixon uh, got a new crew, and then they practiced with it. Dixon started the first submarine school. He would diagram maneuvers in the sand, and then they'd make his crew do calisthenics. I can't imagine what calisthenics were back in 1864. <laughs> and so one night, they would turn a crank, and they went out with a tide, and they sank a brand new Union frigate called the Housatonic flew off the stern and went down in history as the first submarine to ever sink a warship. They never came back. And it was always a big mystery. Whatever happened to the Hunley? P.T. Barnum offered $100,000 for anybody who found the Hunley so he could take it up to his museum in New York. And it went years and years and years and it was never found. People looked for it and just it wasn't there. And nobody could figure out what happened. So we tried in 80, 81, 85, I think 89, 94. And I was there in 94, and then I had to go home. Of course, work on another book to pay for all this foolishness. <laughs> and the fellows, I kept working. One fellow was just a big, heavy southerner named Ralph Wilbanks, who was a genuine true character. And um, in my, I kept him, I said, when you get time, let me know. And I would fax him a grid. And they would search the grid and say, it's not here. I'd fax them another grid. It's not here. Finally, I sent them a grid, and this was, I think, May 5th. He called me. God, it was about 6 in the morning. And he said, well, he says, we ain't going to look for the Hunley no more. I said, oh, gosh, are you giving up? And he said, nah, we found it. <laughs> And the cute story was they were so shocked when they did find it that they went in and, and had dinner and they just they were just still stunned in the silence. And they went out to the Charleston Museum where there was a full-scale replica of the Hunley. And they stood there and looked at it. It was at night. Nobody was around. And Ralph said to the other two fellows that were with him, he said, you know, he said, we're the only ones in the world that know this one isn't correct. <laughs> And then they went out and broke a bottle of champagne over Hunley's grave because he was buried with the, with the second crew, uh, Hunley. And, uh, oh, Hunley's crew, I'm sorry. And they, so they, uh, uh, then, of course, a big scene came because I always thought when we found a wreck, we do an archaeological report, and Kurt comes down and go on to the next one. Well, the head of the South Carolina Institute said he wanted the position of it so they could go put a buoy on it. And I said, why don't you put up a neon sign that says, Vandals come one, come all. <laughs> because Civil War collectors are wild. They dig up graves for the bell puckles. And I said, I'm not giving you the position. And the state of South Carolina tried for two weeks to figure out how to arrest us all. <laughs> and then there was a big fight with the, uh, the government because they said that this is crazy. The General Services Administration owns all the abandoned Confederate property. Now, the General Services Administration, you know, buys desks for, you know, federal offices. And I, I called the director, and he said, I don't know what the hell to do with this thing. So they turned it over to the Navy. There was a big fight with the Navy in the state of South Carolina. So the Navy said, we own it, but you can have it in perpetuity. And that's what happened. So, um, it was a big deal, and they got the money. A fellow by the name of Warren Lash really was the spark plug, and they went out and they raised the Hunley. And then they built this conservation lab, brought it in there where it's been in the tank ever since. And it was filled with silt, 
So most everything on the interior was preserved, even the crew. And they pulled out the crew, just they dug with little trowels, you know, it took them months and months and months and finally got out every little finger bone of the crew. And the big thing they were really looking for was Dixon, the commander of the Hunley. His fiance, Queenie Bennett, when he went in the Confederate Army, had given him a $20 gold piece as a good luck charm. And during the Battle of Shiloh, he was shot in the leg and it hit the gold piece. And everybody thought, he's got to have it on him. And finally, when they were digging around Dixon's bones, they found the gold piece. And it says, my life preserver, Shiloh, and a date. And that gold piece is considered the most priceless artifact of the Civil War. So um, they did reconstruction of the faces and what they looked like and everything. And um, so they decided to, now they're going to bury uh, Dixon's crew next to Hunley. But before that, this one fellow said, why don't we find the first crew, the five guys? So they went out looking and they found that the old Confederate Naval Cemetery was now under a football stadium. <laughs> so they dug under the stadium and they found like about ten graves and then they hit five where the bones were cut up and they had them. So they went out and buried them next to Hunley's crew. Then the time came to bury Dixon and his crew and I mean, did they ever go wild? Uh, we were invited out and, oh God, this, there were 10,000 people. There were a hundred women dressed in antebellum black mourning. And there were 15,000 Confederate reenactors in uniforms. <laughs> and they were going through this big ceremony that lasted for hours, and all these reenactors and everything. And Ralph was sitting just behind me. And I turned around to Ralph and I said, My God, Ralph, what have we done? <laughs> So it was, uh, it was quite a finish. It's one of the few times where we actually followed the shipwreck. I've been searching for the last, though, since 1978 for John Paul Jones ship, the Bonham Richard, which is in the North Sea, and ain't got it yet. Uh, we're going back again, of course, next year. And all we can do is keep expanding the, the, uh, the search area. We've covered, I think, 340 square miles. The Hunley, we dragged the magnetometer 1,449 miles before we found that one. So it's, um, everybody thinks I'm crazy and I belong in a rubber room under restraint because I've never looked for treasure. Uh, and people say, well, who pays for all this? My book royalties. So I guess we all have our weaknesses. And that's, <laughs> that's mine. So it's a fascinating and it's a challenging hobby, I guess you call it. I'm like a dilettante archaeologist, I guess. I wanted to be an archaeologist when I went to college and I found out there was no money in it, so I switched to business. <laughs> but um, it's, been, it's been a fascinating, um, you know, life, I guess, because I, 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 I'm not like a Stephen King. I don't finish one book and start the next. I go look for shipwrecks, I go to car auctions, buy old cars and restore them. So I'm not what you call a dedicated author. I do try, though, to, to really write books that uh, the readers enjoy. Um, I've always considered myself more as an entertainer than a writer, because my job is to entertain you in such a manner that when you reach the end of the book, you, got, you feel you got your money's worth. And that's, that's what I've tried to do. I guess now, if you like, I'll throw it out for questions and answers, if you like. Uh, so, anybody got any? No. Yes, sir. What's your favorite car that you own? Uh, it's like when somebody said, what's your favorite book? I, I like them all for different reasons. Yeah. Uh, there's one that's gorgeous. It's a French car. It's called the Talbot Lago. Beautiful coachwork on it. it. It's interesting, in the old days, uh, the Duesenberg, of course, is nice. Uh, but uh, in the old days, the, the wealthy would decide that they wanted a new limousine or whatever, and so they tell the chauffeur, go down to the dealer and, and purchase a new one. And it was a given. Everybody knew it. The owners, the dealer, the chauffeur would go down, and he got a commission. 
So he would arrange purchasing the chassis and the engine. And when that came in, it was specified which coach maker. And the chauffeur would then would go to the coach maker who drew up four or five different designs of the coach work, which went to the people and they'd select one. And then the car was built. And that's, that's the way it used to work in those days. And times change. I remember I was restoring this Chrysler limousine in 1931, and there was this little kind of silver uh, bracket in the back of the front seat behind the, you know, the divider window. And I, we didn't know what it was. And finally, an old fellow who was an automotive historian came to the shop one day, and I said, come on back and look at this. And he looked at it, and I said, do you know what it is? And he said, oh, yeah. yeah. He said, it held cars. In those days, Mrs. Rich, whoever, <laughs> would drive up to Mrs. Rich, whoever, and she'd take the car, give it to the chauffeur. The chauffeur then would walk up, knock on the door, and the maid would come to present the car, Mrs. So-and-so is here to see Mrs. So-and-so. The maid would shut the door, take the card, and she'd come back and say, Mrs. So-and-so would be happy to meet with Mrs. So-and-so. And the chauffeur would go back, open the door, and escort the lady in. And that's, that's the way it used to work in those days. So it, it's a lot of fascinating thing that goes on with the old cars. I, um, <laughs> um, a fellow by the name of Ralph Engelstad used to own the Imperial Palace in Las Vegas. He's since passed away. And he had one of the premier auto collections, if you've ever seen it there in Las Vegas. And um, he bought this 1915 Cadillac from this fellow in Little Rock, Arkansas. And one of the reasons he bought it, the fellow said that it had belonged to Gloria Swanson. So Ralph put it in the museum. You know, this car belonged to Gloria Swanson, the famous movie actress, and so that, and so forth. And she was still alive. So he contacted her. He says, can you tell me about your, your, your Cadillac? And she wrote back and said, I never had a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. I always drove Pierce Arrow. Mm -hmm. So Ralph got madder than hell, and he sued the guy in Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, Ralph may have been a big casino owner in Las Vegas, but he didn't get the first base in Arkansas. <laughs> he lost the game. And he got mad, and he threw the car up for auction. He said, I'd get rid of it. So I'm sitting there in the audience, and this thing was painted orange with black fenders that looked like a pumpkin, but it wasn't a usual body style. It had a funny little half fender between the doors. And I'm sitting there, and my wife says, bid on it. And I said, why? I said, I don't want it. He says, oh, it's a cute car. Go ahead, bid on it. I, said, I don't want it. You can bid on it. Oh, so I bid on it. Back. Last hand raised, I got it. And so it sat in my warehouse for about three years, and I just didn't like the car. And so. I would said, told my curator, I said, let's sell it. And he said, all right. And about that time, I read this book called The Automobile Quarterly, and there was an article in there on a famous, famous designer by the name of Harley Earl, who designed cars for his dad in Los Angeles back in the early days. And then eventually, he went with General Motors and became the lead designer and came up with concept cars, the big fans, all that. He was, he was a very famous designer. And. Uh, the old cars he designed back in the teens kind of looked like mine. So I thought, is it possible? So I did some research, and a fellow steered me on to, a, he said, Art Earl, Harley's brother, is still alive. Of course, Harley was long gone. So I contacted Art Earl and uh, explained. He said, oh, yeah, he said, I used to work with Harley and my dad. I used to do the upholstery. So I said, well, I've got this car. I don't know, it kind of looks like you know, the designs you, you fellows did. And he said, well, send me a photograph. So I did. <coughs> and he wrote back, and he said, oh, I remember that car. We painted it lime green with Kelly green fenders. And he said, the reason I remember it so well, he said, it was bought by Flo Ziegfeld for his wife, Billy Burke, who was making a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so Ralph should have kept it. <laughs> And it's only one of three Harley Earl's early cars that he built with his father that's still in existence. So what happened when I found that out, I repainted it back to the original colors. And the car immediately became five times more expensive than what I paid for. So sometimes things work out like that. Not often. I, 
Because you, you always, every collector can tell stories of the ones that got away that you just for some reason didn't buy. I remember years ago I sat there when a tucker came across the block and it got up to like 34,000. They said, why don't you bid on it? They said, I'm not paying 35,000 for a tucker. Are you crazy? I went to an auction last January, a tucker sold for 400,000. <laughs> <laughs> so every collector has stories of the ones that got away. So, yes, sir. Um, what do you think of the last book of yours that was made into a movie, Dukes of Sahara, I think it was? Sort of looked like they mixed Dukes of Hazzard with, with your work. I don't know, I think it was mixed with a lot worse than that. Huh? <laughs> I haven't seen it. I can't see it because I'm in the middle of a lawsuit with the producers. And, and the attorney says, don't see it because once I go on the witness stand, I got 20 questions. How did you like it? This and that and the other thing. And I can honestly say I've never seen it. So there's not likely going to be another book no. that's made into a movie real soon. Well, they lost so much money on it. I think you know it's going to figure out even after the DVD sales, uh, they're probably going to lose at least sixty million dollars. So they're not going to they're not going to rush out and do another. One. They just I mean it could have been a good movie, and I, I tried. I, I wrote a screenplay myself. I begged them. I pleaded. I tried to work with them. They wouldn't let me work with the screenwriter, and so I think it's what might have been, you know. So unfortunately, and they didn't follow the book very closely, of course. So, yes, sir. Do you know anything about the Union submarine they're looking for? That's a vintage of the hunter. Oh, the alligator? The alligator, yeah. Uh, I get a laugh out of the alligator. The, the one that they're looking for, the U.S. Navy wants to find one to compete with a Hunley because the Union built a, a submarine. But I can't imagine them finding it because it was under tow, and the tow line either broke or they let it loose. The hatches were covered. The thing could have floated off to Portugal. So they don't, I mean, they don't know where to look for it. I think it's crazy. It's like Amelia Earhart. Uh, <coughs> and they've been two extra spent millions of dollars looking for her plane. And I think they're crazy. Number one, I knew Paul Metz, who flew with Amelia. And Paul used to just flat say she couldn't fly where the dam. In fact, he was with her when she crashed in Hawaii on the first round of the world trip, and he said, I'll never fly with that woman again. <laughs> so the fact that she ran out of fuel flyer and coming down in for a water landing you just know she smashed it in so it's come down in about 200 pieces it's 16,000 feet deep and they're looking for an outline of a plane and they ain't gonna find it so I was in um, the Smithsonian and uh, I, what I came there for was to see this other plane. I wrote a book called The Vin Fizz, which is, uh, the, it's, comes from a um, uh, Cal Perry uh, in 1911, took off with a Wright Flyer and made the first transcontinental flight. And he was sponsored by Hormel Meat Company, who just purchased a soft drink company, who just came out with a grape drink called Vin Fizz. And so it was Vin Fizz painted all over the airplane and he dropped leaflets and so forth. And I remember I was standing there where this guide had 30, 40 people and she's standing around, this plane here was flown by Amelia Earhart and blah, 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 and she started to walk off and I said, just a minute. She said, yes. And I said, you're talking about this plane. It doesn't have that much history. I said, what about the one hanging from the ceiling? She said, what about it? I said, it's the Vin Fizz. She says, I'm not familiar with that one. I said, my God, it made the first transcontinental flight in history, you know. And I was really pissed off. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, <laughs> anyone else? Uh, sir, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry. Um, when you're sitting down to write a large work, like a fiction novel, do you wait until you have pretty much a complete outline of how the plot is going to go, or do you kind of just start and then see where it goes? That probably weighing about 50% of it. Uh, I have the concept, which is usually a what-if concept, you know, what if they do this, what if they do that. And I have to have an ending to work towards. And I've got probably a lot of it in my head. I, I don't really, the only notes I really keep are like, you know, somebody's got red hair. It's amazing that in the middle of the book, you know, you change somebody from red hair to a blonde and blue eyes to green, and even the name, it's crazy. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> Um, so I uh, have that, but a lot of times I'm vague on the middle. 
And it's like I'm riding away and I think it's a little slow. I think I'll throw in a hurricane here. And then <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I have the beginning and I always use a prologue and an epilogue. And uh, uh, I have my ending to work towards. But as they say, sometimes I'm foggy in the middle till I get to it. So. Sir. that you use the in your books. How do you come up with your slants on the legends that you use in your books? I just make them up. Uh, <laughs> 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 There's no formula. I, I just, um, you know, like when Francie likes his treasure, where, where they, you know, they starts out, I always like to start out with kind of a, a big epilogue or prologue that throws the reader, like in that one, the Romans are attacked by these barbarians and they're all killed. And then it turns out in the end of the book, the Romans had buried the Alexandria Library treasure and the barbarians were Indians. Uh, or flood tide, where I have this ship in this big storm that sinks. And everybody, of course, the reader thinks it's in the Pacific of the Atlantic and it was in Lake Superior. So it's, it's fun to do that. I, I enjoy it. And um, somebody's going to ask me, sure as hell, how come you're in the books? I mean, <laughs> It started with a book called Dragon. There was a scene where Pitt was at a car meet. And he walks over to talk to this old fellow I had with gray hair and a beard who has this other classic car next to him. And he says, hi, my name's Dirk Pitt. And I don't know why I typed it. I said, hello, I'm Clive Cussler. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, why did I do that? I thought, what the hell, just for fun. I, I'd like to do things nobody else does. And I left it in. I got 600 letters. I wasn't going to do it again, but I got 600 letters, and now people are always waiting to see where I show up. <laughs> you know, like Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, so it's it's fun. I, I do stuff. It's fun. That's that's basically what it's what it is. So, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you ensure that your books maintain within the realm of possibility? Like all the adventures, how do you make sure they're still realistic? They're pretty far-fetched. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess, you know, it could happen. It's like in Sahara, you know, I abduct Lincoln. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Booth tried about six times to abduct Lincoln. You know, I mean, uh, in his carriage, I forget when he went to a play even, and every time he failed, like one time Lincoln changed his route, the next time he came with, you know, like 20 troopers and all this kind of thing. So. I thought, all right, supposing Booth did abduct him and then go from there. So that's why I say it's always fun to, to plan a what if situation like that. So, yes, ma'am. Is there any one particular book you read like, when you were a kid that you just, like, you know, so as to avoid you know, offending anybody? One that you were forced to read for school that you absolutely hated? No, I. Um, I was very fortunate. My folks, when they would go to town on Saturday night when I was very little, used to dump me off at the library. And so I became a reader. And I used to take home five, six books, read them in the week, and then next Saturday take them back. And I was always an avid reader. I think, what was it, 1938 or 9? I turned in a book report on Gone with the Wind. And the teacher had to call my mother because she didn't believe that I read it. Um, so, no, I was, I was always a heavy reader, enjoyed books. Uh, I, I don't recall really reading a book I hated. I, you know, some are better than others, but uh, no, I, I used to read a lot of the old adventure stuff. I was crazy about history. I was always a history bug. I remember I stumbled on a series, Civil War series, for, you know, young adults, I guess you'd call it. And it was about these two brothers. One was Confederate and one was Union. And... Uh, and I, I still have one of those. Uh, so uh, I, I was always crazy about adventure and history. So, yes, sir. Tell us about Numa. Um, it was the first Von Arm Richard expedition in 1978. It was the first one that I, I really started. And an attorney who was a volunteer said, you know, if you're going to do this madness, you ought to incorporate as a nonprofit foundation. So we did. And, uh, oh, a lot of great trustees came on board. Peter Throckmorton, who was the Dean of American Marine Archaeology. Uh, Don Walsh, who went down in the Trieste, 30,000, eight feet. Um, oh, gosh, I forget who else. Dr. Harold Edgerton, who invented the strobe light and the side scan sonar. And they all wanted to call it the Clive Cussler Foundation. 
And I said, I got an ego, but it ain't that big. <laughs> and so they said, okay, we'll call it, they outvoted me. They said they'd call it Numa, like the one in the book. And that's how that came to be. And um, it's just, a, it's a loose, people think we're in a big office with tons of people. Uh, you're, you're looking at him, I mean. <laughs> I, I research a wreck, and if I think we might stand a chance finding it, then I call, you know, the crew, mostly technicians, sonar, magnetometer, and then, you know, we do have one boat we use for United States, that, uh, like the Richard, I, I charter a boat over there, and then I'll use local divers who know the waters, and that's, that's, that's how it is, it's very simple, so, and I, you know, as I say, I belong in a rubber room because there's no profit in any of this thing. <laughs> no. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry? What type of vehicle are you working on restoring? Uh, an L29 cord. Um, you're not familiar. You're probably, a lot of people are familiar with the later cord, which is considered probably the most beautiful car ever designed, you know, with a coffin nose, they call it. But the L-29 was uh, built in uh, 1929, 30, 31. And even Cord, who built all the great cars, the Auburn, the Duesenberg, um, wanted to build this car. And it was the first car commercially built that was a front wheel drive. And because it was so low, they just came up with some gorgeous um, body styles on it. And I was very fortunate in this one. I got a call from my cousin in Little Falls, uh, Minnesota. And she said, there's a car here. They're tearing down an old garage, and there's an old car here you might be interested in. Well, <laughs> I get these calls all the time, and it's usually a 36 Plymouth or something. <laughs> so I said, all right, Donna, what is it this time? She said, it's a, they said it's a cord. A cord? <laughs> <laughs> So a friend of mine was, was back east, and he was coming back to Denver, and I said, can you stop off and take a look at it? So he flew into Minneapolis, drove up. He called me, and he said, God, he said, you don't want this thing. He said, it was in a horrible accident. The top's half torn off the radiators, plastered back on the engine. He said, it's a mess. And I said, okay, come on home. 20 minutes later, he called me. I said, I bought it for 800 bucks. <laughs> and I said, Why? And he said, I kept looking at it, and then I measured it. He said, it's an extended wheelbase. And they only built the only extended wheelbase on L29 cords were town cars. And the town cars where the chauffeur sits out in the open. And so we had it shipped back, and God, I couldn't believe it, it was a mess. And um, the story was that it was owned by a wealthy brick manufacturer in Minneapolis. And he and his wife and chauffeur were in this horrible accident up in Little Falls. All three were killed. And it sat in this old garage all these years. So we brought in a designer from General Motors who looked at it and reconstructed a drawing of how he thought it was originally. And we, we built it uh, to that uh, specification. And then we, we took a prize at uh, Pebble Beach with it. So it was, you know, it's, it's interesting and things like that. So, yes, sir. What's the next wreck you're going to try and find, and what comes after Polar Ship? Um, the next one, well, my, I'm working with my son on the next pit book. We haven't got a title yet for it. Um, and then I'm working on one with a fellow named Jack DeBurl that's taken over from Craig Durgo on the Oregon Files book. So uh, I, I wrote a children's book, The Vin Fizz, which is coming out in February. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So be patient, they're coming. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Do you have green eyes? Uh, you know, they used to be. Um, it, it's interesting because I always had green eyes, and now everybody says they're blue. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know eyes changed. But, uh, no, uh, I know you're talking like comparing me to Dirk Pitt. Uh, when we started out together, we were both six foot three and 185 pounds. <laughs> and, and his eyes are much greener than mine. And he certainly scored with the girls better than I ever did. <laughs> and now I'm six foot two and, and, you know, and 200 pounds. And, and, you know, we started out together. We were both 36. And now he's like 45 and I'm 74. <laughs> and it ain't fair. It just ain't fair. So anyone else? Yes. Why does your uh, character, your, your uh, 
Oh, I don't know. It's just it's a different series. You know, I, every once in a while, uh, in, in the Dirk Pitt series, I'll have him meet Austin in an elevator or something. But uh, no, I just figured I, I just I'm in the Pitt books. That's enough. I don't have to spread myself out. <laughs> How's that? I wanted the six hundred thousand. I want to see. Oh. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, other than fabricating uh, go between, how do you recommend for people to break into the writing market? No oh, God. <laughs> well, you can write phony stationery, and you know. <laughs> um, I'll tell you, it's it's so close to impossible because people will send the manuscript in to an editor. Now, very rarely is a book what they call taken over the transom by a publisher. And an editor gets between 35 and 50 manuscripts a week. And they usually have a couple of what they call apprentices. And the apprentice's job is to, their instructions are, read the first page. If it doesn't grab you, reject it. And everybody thinks when they get a rejection later, oh, it's a great book, but it's just not quite what we were looking for. It wasn't read. And that's, that's why it's so tough. So you need an agent, and that's, that's, that's the chicken before the egg and all that stuff, trying to get an agent. And the, other than cheating like I did, you just have to send a letter uh, of query telling, let's say, the agent what a marvelous, great book you've got in hopes that, you know, then ask him if he'd like to see a sample chapter in a synopsis and send that. And if you're lucky, then he'll ask for the manuscript. And then if you're really lucky, he'll push it. So it's, it's tough. It's really tough today. Because so. the sales of paperbacks are way off, and they've cut out a lot of what they call the middle authors who would sell like 10,000, 20,000 books. They've cut out a lot of them. They'll take a chance occasionally with a new one. And of course, they rely on the old standbys like me. Uh, but it's, it's tough. It's tough. Anyone? Yes. Could you explain the collaboration you have with some of the other authors that are working with you? How much are you writing and how much are they writing? Or how does that work? Um, it was, they, a publisher came to me. Tom Clancy had come out with a side series called The Op Center, which failed miserably, by the way. And so they said, would you like to try it? So. <laughs> I was fortunate because I'd endorsed uh, this fellow, Paul Comprecos. He wrote a series uh, about this detective in Cape Cod. And so I said, would you like to try it? So we worked together on the first book. And on the next two, Paul writes about 90%. I'll go in, edit, and rewrite. And then we get together two or three times during the year because I have to kind of change the uh, plot. And, and he'll go out and I'll bring him back and this sort of thing. So I really have to give these fellows credit that, you know, my name's at the top, but, you know, they really do the majority of the work. So. Anyone? Yes. Was there any particular inspiration for the plane crash in the lake? Oh, a Vixen 03. Yeah. Um, no, it came from, um, I had a neighbor. Um, who talked about when he took off from Buckley Air Force Base uh, there in Denver. And I forget what he was flying, but he said that, you know, it was loaded and they had the circle and circle and circle and they just barely made it over the mountains. So I thought, I'll have him crash. And I used the C-97 because I was a mechanic and flight engineer on the Boeing Stratocruiser during the Korean situation. So that's that's really that was just the the, the concept and in, in the germ of the idea on that one, and that was that was lifted. There was a movie called Under Siege with George Sakal, with this battleship, and the, the, I, I sat there and I thought, this is Vixen 03. In fact, they even had a character in there by the name of Pitt. So it happens. Yes, ma'am. Oh. So what is by your bedside reading table? What are you reading? Uh, right now I'm reading, um, amazingly, it's the attorney I have in L.A. He's written books on, on Shakespeare, studying really in depth, you know, who wrote those plays. Because nobody that really studies it thinks he did it. There's just absolutely, the guy couldn't write his own signature. 
So it's fascinating. Very fa that's, that's what I'm in the middle of right now. Are you standing up because you want I, me to quit? I, <laughs> I wouldn't dare after that. But I don't know. It's been working pretty hard. I'm okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I was just interested. I, went, I was reading some of the later work, and then I went back and read Iceberg, and it's interesting to see how Dirk Pitt is growing, Evolve. maturing, you know, and, uh, and moving up to the head of Newman and such. And mm -hmm. I wondered how you develop a character like that, because a lot of people, you know, the, the hero is sort of always in his prime and doesn't change a whole lot. But I, I noticed a lot of uh, more maturity there and how that works. I did that. I, I just thought rather than keeping, you know, ageless like James Bond, that he should age. And I've had he and Hal age. And then, you know, I had these kids show up he didn't know he had. And they're eventually taking over. And then I married Pitt off finally to the congresswoman. And so I think it's, and, and my son's, you know, starting to write. So I think it's great for a, a transition, uh, a generational type thing. I mean, no, if, if nobody does it, I'll do it. You know, I mean, <laughs> of course, Jack, you know, now, now Tom Clancy's, they said he, he got the idea, and Jack Ryan has a son now, too. So, no, I do that because it's, it's you know, let's face it, it's a whole new audience out there eventually. And so it's, it's fun. I mean, I, as I say, I like to do stuff that other authors don't do. So, yes? Why was I believe your first book? Pardon me? Oh, uh, which one, the Caper or? I think it was the first book you wrote. The first one I wrote was Pacific Vortex, and I think that's under the same name. Uh, Mediterranean Caper that was published in England as May Day. Published in England as May Day, which is a much better title than Mediterranean Caper. No, the British said that's a stupid title, which I thought so too. <laughs> I didn't want it, but I, you know, I was going along with the editor in those days till I got a little stronger. So no, May Day was a much better title. And there again, that was a what if, you know, what if an old World War I biplane attacks a modern jet base? You know, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, shall I let you go home and watch? Oh, you can still get some TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a real pleasure and a privilege, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>